because we've been in denial for so long uh, about this uh, climate. I think also, you know, we are so focused on the life that we are living now and, and all the perks and benefits that want to continue having our good life that we haven't prepared ourselves for this. And it's it's now dawning on us. You need to be able to, to understand that, to be able to see what are we, are we listening? Are we actually listening or are we, are we listening to what we want to hear? Um, so to be able to actually get to the crunch of things and identifying what they really want um, in a community, for example, to be able to turn it around and say, okay, is it feasible? Welcome to Worldview. At Worldview, we take great interest in sharing everybody's paradigm, knowledge constructs, and Worldview. So welcome. Today, I am really honored to host the next Worldview panel discussion, and we're going to be focusing on the humanitarian development health nexus. And we're going to be talking about that all important must have conversation about how to connect community based primary health care and the humanitarian development framework. I'm going to quickly ask Karen Fisher Little to introduce herself and just quickly give us an overview of who Karen the person is. Karen. Thank you, Jan Hans, for this invitation. I'm honored to be part of this. Uh, so my name is Karen. Uh, I'm a nurse by profession uh, since 20, uh, 31 years. Uh, I have specialities in uh, operating theater, pediatrics, and I have a bachelor in international health. Uh, I worked uh, within the humanitarian and development field for more or less 28 years. Uh, mainly with Medicine Sans Frontières. Uh, I've done 26 years with them, 10 years in the field. And uh, I, But I also worked with the UN and I also done, worked with a uh, development organization in different countries. Um, so I have quite some experience, quite some long experience with this and I'm looking forward to these discussions here today to talk about my experience and knowledge and um, what the future entails. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, and of course, we are, the, the three of us are very happy to be connecting because we are offering um, you this worldview session focusing on humanitarian development, health nexus, from the UN campus here in Bonn. Jake, please, you have the word. Thank you very much. So again, a pleasure, like Karen said, to be on board. Thanks for the invitation. Been looking forward to this. Um, I have, like Karen, uh, some 28 years of experience with the UN, uh, INGOs, and everywhere, I would say, from the Middle East, Far East, Caribbeans, uh, focus, focusing a lot from the early days in, in uh, logistics, coordination, uh, chain, supply chain management, developing into disaster management, uh, moving on to, uh, let's say, the more management side of its structure, conceptualization that I've been working on for the many last years now. Um, initially, I did come from the private sector and from a financial and, let's say, economic side, admin side of things, uh, then taking um, a master's level and let's say, move on from then. Uh, for me, it's been uh, a long, let's say, roller coaster ride in the sense of, of living at combined adventures and the humanitarian concept of, of indulging in what I find fascinating um, and what I've been thinking, what, where could I put my niche and put my footprint? Thank you. Thank you both, Jacob and Karen. So to the world for your audience, let's just, um, set in place the framework of our discussion because today over 2 billion people across the world live in fragile conflict and violence affected settings where difficult living conditions are often exasperated by emergencies such as natural disasters and infectious diseases. 
Emergencies have a direct impact on health. They cause injuries, illness, psychological trauma, and deaths. And through the impact of determinants of health, they increase the population's susceptibility to the diseases or and poor health. For instance, 60% of preventable maternal deaths, 53% of under five deaths, and 45% of new natal deaths take place in the context with conflicts. Displacements and natural disasters. Emergencies also affect health through the damage or the disruption they cause to the health systems and infrastructure. And we've noticed in recent years, emergencies have become increasingly protracted and complex, and they are affecting more people and demanding more resources than ever before. And add to this the climate dimension that we've seen um, in the last couple of months, even here in Europe. According to the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA, the average humanitarian crisis now lasts more than nine years. It has forecast that in 2021, 235 million people will need assistance globally at a cost of around 35 billion US dollars. Improving health outcomes in protracted and complex emergencies require a three-pronged approach focused on responding to the immediate needs, rebuilding the health system, and preventing future emergencies. Traditionally, these three aspects have been divided between the humanitarian, the development, and the peace-building actors with each group working independently using its own coordination, planning, and resource mobilization mechanism. However, that approach does not take into account that activities carried out in one part of the humanitarian development peace nexus tried may have direct consequences for the others. Let me give you an example. Structures and mechanisms put in place during a humanitarian response may have implications for long-term health systems development, as well as for peacekeeping and peace building. Conversely, development work which contravenes the principles of impartiality, neutrality, and the operational independence may cause and increase the need for humanitarian action. It is now widely acknowledged that humanitarian development and peace actions do not occur in chronological sequence, whereby the first transitions towards the latter, rather they occur concurrently, often in the same geographical area and political environments, which with mutual independence and common goals, the coordination, and the complementarity between the different groups of actors are therefore vital, not negotiable. And I'd like to start with you, Karen, if I can um, ask you to engage in the first question, and that is to, um, how do you integrate health into the humanitarian development and peace building activities to better reduce the risk and the vulnerabilities and certainly making sure that no one is left behind. Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Jan Hans. Yeah, it's, it's a very important question. And, and throughout my years uh, with uh, MSF, uh, I've seen this problem uh, arising. Uh, I worked for over six years in Somalia, which is an, uh, a long ongoing conflict, uh, internal conflict. And uh, I've seen how humanitarian uh, organizations, development organizations, and, and also peace building, they are working separately. There is no um, joint uh, venture or discussions. And that means that sometimes we do too much. Uh, we double the things. And sometimes in some areas, people are left all behind because we are not communicating and di diversing 
all the the actions that are being done in these countries. So, and and I mean, me being specialized within the health, I've seen that you know already from the start. I mean, it is really difficult when you go into an emergency or or a conflict, and and you do the immediate. Uh, first aid uh, health um, um, assignments and, and or assignments, but um, actions. But you already there from the very beginning have to think about how can we develop uh, these health actions that we are doing. So we're not just, you know, going in, doing one thing and then we leave because we leave them with nothing then. So it has to be a development planned already from the very first start of uh, going into doing an action in a country. Um, and when it comes to peace building activities, I mean, this becomes a part because if, if you can bring health uh, activities and, and, and secure the health of the population uh, and also then securing work, uh, opportunities for the population that lessens the what studies have shown lessens the risk for conflicts in in certain areas when you can provide this so i think we all all organizations have to be better in in working together and that's what has been you know it, it it's been ongoing for a long time, but we really get need to get to that action uh, and really do it, and not just do the talking uh, in in many what what is happening a lot. I see improvements. A lot has happened. A lot of development has happened. I've seen that within the organization that I spent most of my time with, uh, but we still a lot needs to be done uh, in this area. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, Jacob, based on what Karen was saying to us and, and sharing that um, it, it's still very much the, um, the emergency response, the humanitarian action to try and address the immediate needs of the affected populations, um, move in, um, do the assistance, but then very often um, not necessarily giving the same attention to the long-term development needs and actions um, which needs to be anchored within a sense of ownership of the local communities. Could you please talk to us then um, in terms of your humanitarian development framework, how do you go about it? And I believe you shortly will be leaving to, to Africa. So talk to us a little bit how you are going to um, approach and deploy this um your 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 mission and your integration of this humanitarian framework to ensure ownership is taken by the local community thank you Jonas. Uh, if i may expand a little bit on on what karen was saying um maybe from a little bit of a personal experience and umbrella afterwards umbrella bit, umbrella perspective overview the Karen and I, and I'm sorry, Karen, I, I'm taking something for granted here, but your field experience and mine, uh, we've witnessed an evolution in, in the humanitarian world response as to before we went out and we were going to out and do good. Uh, that was very much, we would come and we would set up and we would deliver and we would go home again. Uh, the evolution has changed a lot in the humanitarian response and you mentioned the nexus. Uh, it's very much now to, to be a lot more engaged in being better at addressing the needs, actually identifying the needs, making sure that the right partnerships are in place, then we're conceptualizing what is, the, let's say, the framework. And most important, and you also mentioned this, is the actual the local buy-in, the local ownership of something where we've had too many experiences over many, many years where we find out we're throwing tons of equipment, support, uh, expertise, at something that is not really needed in the long run. Now, going back to, to your question about response, I've been privileged enough to try many sectors in the first years in the private sector. 
I was very much at the, the, the business development side of projects in Africa. And I'm sorry to say many of them were sort of the white elephant concept. We come in, we set up shop, uh, long-term development, we pull out and everything falls to pieces. Um, <clears throat> I got into a response a uh, disaster through a small organization uh, under OCHA called UNDAC, which is the Disaster Assessment Coordination. First responders, if you have it, and we go out and let's say within a few hours or 24 hours to an affected region that we have been invited out to. Now, that's the interesting part is that what we start using a different sort of methodology in, in, in setting ourselves, and I'm going to use words like cultural awareness and understanding of what is actually needed, the counterparts. We are not, as in the old days, asked to come in, uh, or we are this time asked to come in and provide specific support if we have the right expertise. In the older days, so to speak, we would come and we would deduce what the needs were and we would throw the package at them. So, but from my experience, and I've been lucky enough to work with this UNDAC organization for the past 14 years, I've also had the pleasure of working with, with the Red Cross uh, movement. Uh, so I see from the Archer UNDAC perspective, which is very much more, let's say the overall objective or coordination uh, communication, to the Red Cross of, of hands-on um, in the field uh, being, I mean, both feet on the ground. Uh, it's not that black and white, uh, you have it, but but it does mean that I've now got a very good picture of, let's say, the private sector, the, the overall um, coordination sector from the UN, and of course, the Red Cross, and it's not to diminish any, any of the groupings. But what, to get back to the point is that we are realizing there's a bigger need for us to also work together, as you indicated, uh, that we need to get back to in the, in the steps of being able to work across our silos uh, to be able to do good in the field. There's a lot more demand from the donor side that we should work together in the humanitarian response. And that also leads us to Nexus perspective of how that we're able to look into development and but also security very much from a humanitarian perspective and this is a triangular thing sometimes i must admit i have a little bit of a hard time that we we have to hang things up on a name um such as you know build back better or or, or triple nexus and so on but apparently it is needed for us to make sure that we have the right methodology and process to get in place um that said to get to your original question is that yes i'm off to africa now and uh, and I'm privileged to be part of uh, something called the, the Lake Chad Basin Com uh, um, Commission. Uh, and let's say as one of the co-lead on the humanitarian and um, development clusters. It's, it's, a, it's a project that's been going on for 60 years, 50 years plus. Um, Boko Haram did not uh, ease the situation uh, quite the opposite. We've now now know there's a more intensive need. Uh, thankfully, Boko Haram has more or less disappeared as as a person, but being re-established by ISIS and ISWAP and other uh, more fundamental approaches. To get to the point is, we need to go out and see how do we deal in a long-term conflict like this. How do we get our footsteps in there, and how can we actually help making sure that. The many people, I mean, we're talking millions, 15 million plus that are affected. How can we make sure that we're, we're giving them sort of long-term perspective that they've already been run under uh, the auspices of, of conf conflict for the last many, many, many years. So again, this is again of doing a proper assessment. Who are the partnerships? How can we conceptualize and how, but even more important, who are the local um, players? How do we make sure that we are there for them and not the other way around? Thank you. Thank you, Jake. But um, I, I would like to push back and say, um, isn't this just another, um, you know, assessment mission where you are um, going to, again, um, you know, play part in what so many of the um, critics to the whole international development um, nexus would say it's just dabbling more in the humanitarian supermarket. So what is it that through the United Nations um, 
Institute for Training and Research, you think you're going to be able to bring that is going to result in concrete results for the Lake Chad region and its communities? I think there's a bit of history there that um, there's, a, there's a Lake uh, the LCBC, Lake Chad Basin Commission, has been going on for many years. Uh, it had a, let's say, more need or strengthening focus uh, on the ploy of, of Boko Haram. Uh, I think there's the advantages, and, and here I can't speak, speak for myself, but, but there is a new generation of humanitarians out there. Um, there are also, uh, there's also, compared to maybe 30 years ago, a new, thankfully, a generation of, of African experts who have been uh, dealing, or uh, let's say, top professional experts, and again, dealing with, with specialists and wonderful people who, who have amazing capabilities uh, is, is very different from, again, 30 years ago, when you felt that you were coming out and maybe dictating the needs. Here, it's the other way around. So to answer your question is, yes, it is another assessment, but the difference is that we need to look at activities, what we're doing, how can we ensure better and optimal implementation of those activities and make sure they are grounded or anchored, if you like. Um, if they're not anchored and we don't get that local buy-in, it's just going to be another flop, as you indicated. So it's, for me, it's a very much of, of setting up a methodology uh, of implementation, uh, but making sure that we've got a coordination between the many, many activities that, that are going on, but very much with the local anchorage. Does that sort of fit the question, I hope? Thank you very much, Jay. And Karen, if, if I could loop back to you and, and um, ask you the same question, but just to articulate differently is, how then do you, through the work that you do, um, through the lens of UNITAR, how then do you make sure that you have access to all the victims and individuals who need um, emergency healthcare in these areas where they are the tribal minorities, the ethical minorities. So how do you make sure that you are able to reach those furthest behind? Yeah, thank you. Uh, as, as you mentioned previously, leave no one behind. I mean, that that is uh, something that we have to use as a, as a guiding light you know that we have we have to reach everyone despite uh, what uh, background or affiliations they have and I mean one of the most important things is education um, to train the people and educate the people that are in these countries where we are working um, what we have seen what have I seen throughout my experience is a brain drain from, from these countries because as soon as they have an education, um, they tend to leave to go and find uh, a better paid job somewhere else or better opportunities uh, in other countries. And then still there is nothing left in, in, in the country where the needs might be the most. So it's important that we continue to, to educate um, and increase the human capital um, in, in uh, these countries. I mean, capacity building in, in all different kinds of areas and make sure that this capacity building is not only done in the capital, it's also that we have the opportunity and ability to, to give it to people who might not be able to leave uh, their areas because of conflicts or other reasons. And there we have to be inventive and see how can we reach them. And, and it can, I was just uh, in Niger uh, recently and uh, we went uh, out to one of the uh, areas where, you know, the development has taken place the least. Uh, they, they don't have electricity everywhere, they don't have uh, telephone lines and things like that. So 
And so how can we help them in this place by combining uh, different areas? So what we looked into now is to, uh, we went to a health center, they didn't have electricity, the midwife, when she was delivering during night, she was sitting with a torch in her mouth to be able to see what she was doing. And I mean, here it's a good opportunity to combine, you know, development. We want to, to install um, solar panels so they can have energy 24 seven without, you know, having to have, uh, and also it's environmental friendly. So we're looking into all these different uh, aspects. And also by by having um, this um, energy access to energy, they can also then you know have better access to um, communication services. And by having access to communication, we can then give them a remote training um, via different kinds of means. So. I think this is how UNITAR can contribute to, to this uh, humanitarian development health nexus by uh, ensuring that education and training and capacity building is reaching to all these areas where there are, the access is almost none. Um, and I think we have an important role to play there as an organization. Thank you for that. Karen. Yeah, Just sorry. if I may, um, uh, before I, I give you the word again, um, Jacob, I, I would like both of you also to um, reflect and share with us how you integrate the element of traditional knowledge that is embedded in this communities um, and, and how you ensure to integrate that rather than always um, what we've seen, um, sort of the European perspective bring, and, the, and the developed world bringing their perspective and the global South is seen as a playground to test um, their ideas. And how do we um, ensure and, and, and give me some examples in your um, experiences how you used the tribal knowledge and the uh, traditional um, very often held by the, the elders um, and how you've integrated that into your approach. But I let you respond, Jake, before. Um, yeah, and I'm sorry for the interruption. I What I would just like to get back to and challenge maybe Karen a little bit is that there is a brain drain, but it's from a, let's, let's say maybe, maybe I'm made, maybe a bit focused on the humanitarian side, but I do see a lesser one, so, especially with the experts, experts that I'm working with uh, that are, let's say, African, uh, maybe not from their own country in Africa, uh, but, but there's, a, there's a wonderful generation, very young generation, and possibly a few of, of our generation, who are these experts who are coming back, so to say. They're not just necessarily, they want to go back and, and maybe not, like I said, in their own, own country to do uh, the humanitarian uh, and development work, but they are conscious they want to go back to the continent and do better. And I think that this, we see more and more of that. And you will see maybe less of the traditional humanitarians or from other nationals coming in uh, because they have their own expertise by now. Um, sorry, that was just sidestepping a bit. Uh, Absolutely. But can I also respond to that? Because yes, they can work in other countries, but I, I think all organizations, uh, humanitarian development and so on, have to see, take a look at themselves and see, you know, because if you go and work in the neighbor country, you will have a higher salary because, because you become an expat. But if you stay in your own country, you have a national staff salary. And that is usually often less with less benefits and things like that. And I think that, uh, you know, if they would have same uh, possibilities uh, as when they go as an expat, uh, and but to stay in their own country and do the work that they can, because they, as you say, I see so many who are trained and are professionals now, and I, I I'm so happy to see that, but they, we should also, organizations have a responsibility to allow and make sure that they can stay in their own country 
by having the same uh, benefits and, and uh, salaries as if they would go to another country and work. I think that's something that needs to be looked at much more uh, because it is becoming, you know, it is tempting to, I understand, I would do the same uh, to go to, if I can go to the neighboring country and work and have double the salary and more benefits, I would do the same. Very young generations. I mean, I do see when I'm when I've been visiting for the past six months, uh, various places in Africa. You may call it when we started um, slightly, maybe a bit ideological, but uh, but, but I just think, think still watching very young, very well educated uh, people who uh, uh, experts who come back and they want to do better i see what you're saying but many, many of them also come back to their set say own countries uh they, they may move on as we all move on uh but i still see them come home with an interest i agree with you that after a while this may let's say um, the ideology may be replaced by by realistic and saying okay we all need to make money and maybe on the other side of the in a neighboring country there's a better salary absolutely right but I do see the other thing uh, happening with a younger generation coming in saying, yes, I want to do something on my, it's a bit of payback or I want to do something from my, what I grew up in, in my backyard that I want to, to improve. Um, thank you very much to both of you for that uh, discussion about, uh, um, you know, developing local expertise, um, as Karen said, um, that that needs to be, there needs to be um, equity in the sense of uh, flattening out that it's a uh, relative rather than uh, the expert that comes from the donor country therefore has uh, because then uh, we just see as you both said is this such great inequality and therefore it creates a market dynamic all all in itself but if i can ask us to move on to the question of the how do we how do we and give us some examples so that the world view um audience and community can can learn from your practice um some examples how you integrate traditional knowledge um and and the intellectual capital that sits with so many of the elders and communities where you work um and how you've integrated that into your problems um into your programs so if i can ask and also some of the problems they may have caused um over to you karen yeah thank you um yeah i mean when I've been out working, and uh, I always uh, made sure when when I come into to a new place that I sit down with, as you say, the elders, youth groups, but also a very important group, the women group, uh, and and ask them what what do they see as needs, and and where do they see it's more important that we uh, put our work uh, into. I mean, I've been working with health um, throughout my time, and um, there, I mean, there is normally a standard package which is needed everywhere. Uh, uh, you know, those common illnesses and things that we see, but we also seen an increase in um, diseases that uh, we in the Western world or the, or the the world where we had more to eat and, and so on are also coming to these countries so we have to adopt uh, the needs uh, in these countries like blood pressure medicine that's nothing that i had in the beginning uh, when we went out but that's something that is needed insulin is uh, another thing for diabetes so we are uh, we have to adopt and and to see and and also I mean, maybe they they see another need. Um, they have had a uh, long ongoing war and they have a lot of war wounded, uh, a lot of amputees and things like that. So uh, there is a need for physiotherapy for this or, or uh, you know, help. So in all these kind of discussions, you, you get uh, information crucial and vital information on, on what is needed in, in these places where we're working. And I think it's also important that you go in and 
really listen and not just listen and then say, yeah, 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 but we know what's best for you. And, and this is what we've been doing elsewhere. And, and this is what we deliver, but that you really take into account. Uh, just to give you like an example in Afghanistan, I wasn't working there, but it was a colleague of mine who, who told me about how they did to, to get the females to come for um, prenatal uh, visits. They opened a barbershop uh, in the hospital. So the men then would bring their women and while the woman was in uh, on her visit, a prenatal visit, the men went to the barbershop. So they adapted to the culture. So the, you know, otherwise the men didn't see any reason and, and they didn't want to sit around and wait. Uh, so we saw, and this increased actually uh, the number of women coming to the hospital for prenatal uh, checks, which is very, very important to be able to catch this and, and to prevent maternal death or, or uh, prenatal deaths. So, I mean, you know, we have to be more sensitive in these areas, culture and, and also religious sensitive uh, to be able to, to give the correct care and um, in this, uh, in this case, healthcare. Um, and when I was in Niger now, when I, when I went to this health center, I asked them, so, you know, what do you want us to do here? What is, what are your needs? Uh, because I asked them a lot of questions uh, that I had, but in the end, you know, it's what, what do you see is most important? And for them, you know, we, we were quite close to each other uh, and um, I think, yeah, and I followed what they said and, and when I wrote my report and I, I put some of their wishes into to, to my report and said, this is also what we should do. So it's important to, to really listen and not only, you know, pretend to listen because that's uh, that's what's been done for many years you know we have all these meetings and, and and then we don't pay attention to what is being said thank you so much Karen Jacob please share with us some of your um experience and some of your insights and um necessity to integrate um traditional knowledge and um traditional um, know-how into so many of your actions and programs. Thank you. Uh, not unlike, very much like what uh, Karen was said, I mean, the, the approach is, is very much that you you go through the gatekeepers initially. Uh, when we do, to come back to these many assessments that you were referring to, part of that is to speak to the many stakeholders there are in a community. So. In my case, if it's Afghan, it might be a bit more difficult for me to approach the women. But uh, having said that, it's, it's up to me to ensure that they are also listened to. So either via my interpreter or the interpreter's interpreter, which makes it easier to approach uh, women uh, for, for gender issues. Now, many of the things that we're trying to capture is also when you have to be aware of of more basically cultural awareness. You have to have your antennas out for very much who is saying something, but just as much who is not saying anything um, to find out what, if, if there's a special group uh, that is not saying anything, why aren't they saying anything? Are there any special needs there? And language goes far. Uh, interpretation is, is a tool, uh, but it's becoming more and more important, I find, that, that you are actually able to, to speak a language uh, or at least have a, some, some understanding of, of what's going on, especially as Karen said, also a cultural issue. Uh, we, need to, we need to be able to, to understand that, to be able to see what are we, are we listening? Are we actually listening or are we, are we listening to what we want to hear? Uh, so to be able to actually get to the crunch of things and identifying what they really want um, in a community, for example, to be able to turn it around and say, okay, is it feasible? I mean, because sometimes there's a difference between needs and there's also off the shelf, uh, let's say, provide provisions, and there's also the wish list. So it's a question of how can we set up 
incrementally uh, response uh, long-term projects that make sure that we're actually benefiting somebody without omitting others, uh, that we are not um, that, that we're not pushing another community out or a part of a community out. So it's really being aware of, of the constellation which makes humanitarian and back again, uh, if you want the nexus uh, at, at, at a lower level to be, it's complex. It is getting complex if you really want to listen and if you really want to do the right implementation for the long term. We are over and done with, with uh, we should be over and done with, with the, let's say, we come in, we pull out, but we need to leave a footprint that is their footprint that they can take over uh, for the very, very long term. Uh, so that we hopefully are giving them tools, uh, provisions uh, that they don't need to come back and ask for the same thing again, uh, but given, giving them the strength to be better prepared or resilience and so forth. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And if we, um... For the last part um, of our conversation, if we can turn the page and focus um, on the climate health um, challenges that we're going to be facing, because the, the EU's researchers estimate that we will have, by the end of the 21st century, more than 135,000 climate-related deaths. How do you, in your work, already integrate the reality of climate-related health issues and long-term humanitarian impacts? i give you a couple of examples. Um, the fact that so many governments have started using natural resources such as water as a tradable commodity where the rights have been sold off to commercial entities and when the communities now need to have access to clean drinking water it is something that needs to be purchased the decline of arable land we have seen that during the last couple of months here in europe the climate um, effect the um, thousands of acres of forests, biodiversity that is being destroyed, um, the agricultural characteristics that are changing. And how do you, and, and, I, and I would like us for the purpose of the second part of this conversation, if we can stay and focus a bit on the climate related impacts in Europe, rather than always um, focusing on, on Africa, water in areas, because there is a huge risk related and specifically a health and climate related risks. And please tell me, um, Karen, how do you um, see this? And then I'll ask um, Jacob to share his view as well. Karen, you have the word. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, and this is really, it's a really difficult and big question. And, and I think it's uh, a question that we are absolutely not set up for uh, at this moment. We're not ready for this. Uh, in If we just look at Sweden and uh, how we've been, how I mean, COVID is not um, nature related, but we're, you know, we were not set up uh, to respond to uh, a big pandemic like this, and, and neither was Europe. I mean, we're more used to, to these kind of outbreaks in, in other parts of the world where maybe they don't have the means uh, to respond to it, but they have the know-how and how to deal with uh, these things. And, and I think it, it comes back also to how to relate um, health uh, needs in, in, in regards of, of the, the climate um, impact that is ongoing. I don't think we really know how, um, I mean, yes, we have these heat waves with, which has a big impact on, on, on the health, uh, especially for elderly or weak people. And, uh, but I don't think Yet, we have seen the full extent how it will have an impact on, on other health issues. Uh, I think that will come a bit, you know, in, in steps or, or we will see more outbreaks uh, here as well. Um, but, I, you know, we're, 
because we've been in denial for so long uh, about this uh, climate. I think also, you know, we're so focused on the life that we are living now and, and all the perks and benefits and, and how we, you know, want to continue having our good life that we haven't prepared ourselves for this. And it's it's now dawning on us. And, it's, and I think, you know, it will be difficult because all countries around the world are uh, lacking healthcare staff. I mean, it's and especially when I'm talking about nurses, my profession, um, we're lacking. Uh, I think it's over um, a million nurses around the world, uh, you know, in all countries. I don't think it's almost no country that has um, good setup of nurses and healthcare, and that will have a huge impact because. If we don't have the healthcare capacity to take care of this globally, um, and the climate is it's it's coming quick on us, this climate change. I think we it, it will also have a huge impact. And and I mean, there I see, you know, we have to educate more people, we have to get more people into this. Uh, I'm now talking about my profession, because otherwise we will not be able to handle any kind of healthcare issues related to the climate in the future. It will be a huge, huge problem. And that's globally uh, that we will see that. Thank you so much, Karen. Jacob, your thoughts, please. I couldn't agree with Karen more. Um, I think it's very much been us and them in the sense that we've been looking at Africa, Asia, and what can we do there? send our expertise out there, we still, we really, really need to start looking out back in our own backyard. For many years, the, the civil protection mechanisms in Europe have been reduced uh, drastically uh, for, let's say, lack of need, urgent need. We're going to see urgency in that. Uh, We're going to see a big surprise that my prediction is with all the drought here, it's going to turn around. Yes, the flooding and, and downpours are happening in, in Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, there is, but I think in a few days or weeks, it's got the same things are going to happen in Europe where we're going to be very surprised because it's going to be concentrated downpours. We can and hopefully will start looking at uh, activities like what we call forecast based activities where we get in better preparations, uh, better mitigation methods and so on. But what is scary is just two weeks ago, I would be sitting at a, at a, at a, at a, at a dinner, a uh, formal dinner, uh, speaking to, to one a large um, private company that would do a lot for the humanitarian health and support, uh, but asking them, you know, what are we going to put our, how can we help Europe? And that again, like Karen said, we are very much in denial because this company, for example, which was one of many, I uh, would say, but it's we're not looking at Europe. We're looking at in development countries. We're looking at the classical uh, African, Asia, Middle East. Um, so it's not a, our problem. And this is sort of the blinded privilege that we've been going through for, for many, many years. And it's going to hit us really, really hard. Uh, Karen is in a lot more better, better position to say the long term on, on the health perspective. Uh, from my perspective, it is that we need to put a better conceptualization as to how do we ensure stakeholder involvement. And hopefully we can, I wouldn't say copy paste, but all the work we've been doing abroad needs to be uh, set up in a stronger structure. Thank you, we have for the EU mechanism, uh, which is very, very strong, uh, that there is a setup there, but whether they can, the, the I, it's so difficult to, to predict the severity of what's going to happen in Europe, but you're right. We did something that we haven't focused on far than enough, more than enough. Thank you both, Karen and Jacob. Um, and, and we're coming to the conclusion, and I would like you to imagine, you have the opportunity to write a postcard to the most influential people in the world, and I would like you to take a minute to think about it. And I would like you to, to share with us what would you write about and who would you send 
this postcard to? Jacob, let's start with you. It's a very tough one, um, possibly because mature age has moved from ideology to 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 real, a realistic perception, semi-realistic perception. Um, I don't want to sound negative, but it's incredibly difficult. Uh, I would, I would, I would turn it around, and I would say uh, to the next generation, um, we haven't done well. Um, how can we help you now uh, to 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 move on? And I'm not only relying on their, let's say, new innovation, innovational ideas, but it's a question: how can we, with through education, through capacity building, through institutions. How can we support that next generation in the greatest possible needs? And there are some wonderful initiatives taking place all over and several places in the world where we are focusing on the next needs. But I would very much love to take in that next generation to make sure that we are giving them, I mean, no limits to, to what we can provide. Who the addressee uh, is going to be I'm not quite sure about that one yet. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Karen, how about yeah. you? Uh, <laughs> I agree, it's a tough one, uh, but interesting one. And, and yeah, I want to continue on what Jacob was saying, you know, apologize to, to the generation taking over from us. I mean, we, we really wrecked their world uh, to be, yeah? And uh, I mean, to the world leaders, you know, stop bickering about uh, trades, uh, you know, fees and things like that, and, and open your eyes and see what's happening into the world and, and uh, stop consuming it uh, as we are doing. We're consuming, uh, I mean, it's like, you know, you have this packet of orange juice and we're just continuing and, and it's it's empty, but we're continuing to suck it out because we, you know, think it might be another drip there that we can feast on. Um, and we have to stop doing that. And that includes me as well. I have to be better at it as well. And, and yeah, we have to stop start sharing all the resources that is out there um, and share it carefully and, and not, uh, you know, recklessly or, or just headlessly consume whatever is it is. Um, so, yeah, to the ones with a bigger power, uh, because there are a few ones, a few world leaders out there who actually can have uh, an impact uh, uh, to do changes and uh, they know who they are. And would you like to know to whom I would send my postcard and what I would say? Yes, please. Right, so my postcard would be addressed to Karen Fisher Little to say, you know, you just said it, you said, you can make so many changes. You have the power to make so much changes. And I would like to say to you, thank you. Thank you for being a mother. Thank you for being a colleague. Thank you for being a wife. But more importantly, thank you for a colleague that we share the tragedy of um, self-imposed death in our families. And um, you've just, with the most extraordinary bravery, fragility, and just your special brand of being Karen, being strong, being fragile, but more importantly, being all these facets of, of being a woman, being a mother, being a colleague, being so many um, roles and, and just performing that par excellence. And for that, I want to conclude our session today by saying, Karen, you are absolutely a shining light because when you talk about mental health and 
the 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 testament that Jacob, your colleagues in the United Nations Institute of Training and Research, have witnessed during the last couple of weeks. And all I can say to you is, my God, you have our absolute admiration and respect. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, the community of um, Worldview, thank you so much for joining us again. Karen, um, Jake, I wish you much success um, in your future missions. And I do hope to see you soon in EU, um, the Bon Compass very soon. But more importantly, please continue to deliver that quality work, but also that magic of who you are as individuals, because that is where it starts. And for that, I say to you, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.